first of all, thank you very much to Maria um, for the opportunity to come along today to talk to everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, it was a great privilege to be able to uh, be part of uh, the team looking after Maria when she was with us at the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, and uh, she's gone on to superb and, and great things afterwards. So, you know, um, brilliant. Couldn't be prouder. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to all the other participants today for what have been a really fascinating range of talks and thought provoking questions, uh, as well as to the support team and everybody who's kind of helped out to, to get things where, where they are today. Um, so, as Maria said, my name is Daniel Waller. I work at the University of Central Lancashire as the head of school uh, for Humanities, Language and Global Studies. Uh, if you don't know where the University of Central Lancashire is, it's in Preston. Um, at that point, I always have to say, and Preston is close to Manchester. Uh, and then people have a notion of, of where we are. Um, we are a, quite a large university, if a rather anonymous university <laughs> at some points. Um, so I wanted to do a talk today about an activities where I thought teachers might be uh, might want to consider adding to their kind of repertoire uh, and things that, you know, the activities that they have up their sleeve. Uh, there was a really good piece of research not long ago which looked at how teachers use training and how teachers use um, the things they pick up in in seminars and events and and what it says is teachers tend to sort of squirrel these things away um, and then when they actually need them that's when they kind of say oh I remember I, I, I need something to do this and that's when they pull out a, a tool that they've come across so hopefully um, this will inspire people to perhaps use something in the future. It's also important to say concordancing um, is not, there's nothing new about it, um, but it is something that teachers often shy away um, because it can look kind of quite overbearing or sometimes it's people are not quite sure how to use it. So the aim today is to sort of look at how we might use this technique in the classroom uh, to bring sort of natural language to students in a way also that's not going to create lots and lots of extra work for the teachers involved. So, to start off with, um, is it? So the first question there really is, is what is a concordance um, and why would you want to use it? Um, so a concordance uh, is drawn from a corpus. So if you've not come across them before, a corpus is a, is a collection of texts, uh, these days electronic texts stored together. And the key definition that Sinclair put forward is the idea is a principled collection of texts. So the idea is that these texts have been brought together for some sort of purpose or because they have some kind of link. And that's really important because if the corpus you draw <coughs> your concordance lines from is no good, the concordance lines you get out will also be no good as well. It's very important that you think very carefully about what text you're, draw you're drawing from. Uh, there's, a there's a wide range of corpora available and there's a slide at the end of this which has got links to a number of the, the major corpora. But examples you might have come across are things like the British National Corpus, which is a set of UK written and spoken texts collected over time. There is the My Case Corpus, which is a selection of spoken academic English. Um, I've got a colleague who has built a corpus of Sherlock Holmes stories um, because he wants to look at the language used in, in Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, you can build uh, you know, for, for professional corpuses um, can be sort of billions of words, you know, millions of texts put in. But a corpus can be as large or as small as you kind of need it to be. Um, the question is, what, what is it that you want the corpus for? What is it that you want the concordance lines for? What's your context and what do your learners need? Um, and that's, that's the, for kind of the guiding principle for deciding what you're going to draw from. On the screen there, you should be able to see an example of a concordance line. This is using the words heavy rain. So I put this into the British National Corpus and it's pulled out some examples of the use of heavy rain. And you can see over on the left, some of these are spoken 
texts, some of these are interviews, some of these are from broadcast news, some of these are from newspapers, um, but you can see the, the idea of keyword in context for quick, which is the sort of the underlined word in there, and you can see heavy rain in each line, um, and that's the kind of the focus of the, the search in that. And so this is an example of a, of a concordance. So why might you want to use a concordance in the classroom? Because um, you, you might be doing like I did originally when I, years ago when I came across the first one and sort of went, crikey, I can't ever see myself using that. Um, they provide an opportunity to focus on awareness raising um, when you want to look at a very specific piece of language. Um, Batstone and Ellis talk about the given to new principle and about explicit function of explicit, sorry, explicit focus on pieces of language. And the idea of a concordance is it gives students an opportunity to notice a piece of language and to really notice it because it's right there in the middle. Um, so if you want them to look at a piece of language and to think about how it's used, this is a really good opportunity. And you can also highlight collocations and patterns of usage. And I'll give you my kind of my kind of first example, which I hope will also kind of give you an idea of why you might want to use a concordance. So I'll start off. Um, I'm sure you've all come across the word research before. Um, it's a very frequent word um, in the British National Corpus and the contemporary corpus of uh, sorry the corpus of contemporary American English. It is in the second thousand frequency list, so it's a very very frequent word. In B1, it's sorry Common European Framework uh, English Profile. It's a B1 word, so it's, it's you know it comes across, learners come across it quite early on, and it appears as a verb in uh, the Common European Framework English Profile at B2. So very, very common word. And a number of years ago, I was teaching uh, a small group of electronic engineers uh, who were coming to the university uh, and they were undertaking a, a, a short course before they started their degree. Uh, these were good, strong B2 students. So they were good independent users. Their English was good enough to be starting on a, a degree program at university. Um, because it was a short course, I pulled together a few materials that I thought would be interesting to electronic engineers, and I put them together into uh, a corpus, um, sort, of, sort of put them into a computer, and searched them against the academic word list. And one of the words that came up from the academic word list was research. So I showed them a concordance of um, examples of the word research based on the text that they'd already read. So we were looking at materials that they had done in class that we had spent time on uh, doing comprehension, um, talking about. Now what really surprised me was so a group of strong students, they all knew that research was a noun, but they were genuinely surprised to see it as a verb despite the fact that we were using the same materials that we had been using in the classroom, that they had engaged with and done activities around. So even though they'd been exposed to those materials, until they actually saw the word research highlighted in concordance lines, they didn't actually realise that you could use it as a verb. And I think this is a good example of, of where using things like concordance lines with high frequency language can help students to do more with the simple language, with the most frequent language. And what we know about proficient users of, of English is not necessarily that they have millions and millions more words, it's the ability to do more with the most frequent words. So concordancing is a good way of revisiting language, because I'm sure if you said to many of your students, do you know the word research, they would say yes. But perhaps if they looked at it in different contexts, they might start to say, OK, I didn't realise you could use it like that. So there are some options that I'm going to put in front of you, which are ways of using uh, concordancing. The first one, which I've just talked about, is the idea of, of building your own corpus around your teaching materials. 
So for example, in the case of I've just talked about, I had a small set of materials that I was using with the electronic engineering students. Um, I put them into uh, a resource like Lex Tutor CA, which is a free uh, website um, and has got all kinds of lexical tools on it. Uh, it's an absolutely superb resource and I couldn't praise it enough. And you can use that not only to sort of look at word uh, texts against academic, against different word lists, but you can also, there are also um, concordancing tools on there to produce concordance lines. So one way of doing it is just using your own existing materials. The second one is getting learners to make their own corpus and then draw concordancing lines out of that. And the third one is to use materials, use information from an existing corpus. So I've already talked a little bit about making your own corpus um, from materials with the example of electronic engineers. I'm going to go on to the second one because this is really where I got interested in concordancing as something I could use in the classroom. Um, and to talk about this, I'm, I do need to acknowledge Jane Willis's article, which is an app, again, it's from 1998. It's, it's a quite an old article, but it is an extremely good one. Um, but it also sets out kind of the, the problem that I was trying to solve when I turned to a concordance. The difficulty I had uh, was I was teaching overseas. I had a group of students who were uh, pretty much complete beginners. Um, the closest I ever had to a class of students who were almost entirely complete beginners. Um, it was quite early on in their course. Uh, we were about three weeks into the, into the course and we suddenly hit upon a problem. Uh, we were using a Headway Elementary textbook, which I don't know if you've come across it, but, but it's, it's a, a basic English language textbook. And the textbook suddenly started using words like and, but, because, and so. But there was nothing in the text book to teach these words. It was just kind of assumed somehow that students knew what they meant or, and could use them. And this, see, because the students were uh, really quite sort of almost a complete beginners, this was, this was really problematic. But also the way in which uh, these words were used in the, in the actual uh, original language, the language of the students, was different in terms of punctuation and the way the sentence was structured. So it was quite, you know, suddenly the students were kind of struggling with these words. And even if they could kind of use the word, they couldn't quite get it right in terms of writing. So at this stage, you have a think, and, I, and I, as I said at the start, teachers often go back to things they've heard about and you pull out an idea when you are in a situation when you need it. And I remembered the, the, the article from Willis, so I went back and had another look at it. And it suggested this idea of, of actually building, getting the students to build concordance lines. So what we did was we'd already done the first three chapters of the book. We'd already used those. Uh, they had a number of texts in them. So I put the students into groups, told them to look at the first three chapters of the book. Each group was given a word or a word to look for. Uh, so either and, but, because, or so. Um, this was before we kind of had recourse to, to all the computer stuff. So. I got them to use A2 sheets of paper and board markers to write their examples on. So one group had a big piece of paper and were writing examples of, of but in their sentences. Others were writing sentences using because. And once they collected the examples, we put the papers up around the room and asked them to notice how each of these words was being used. And these days you could use a number of online tools to get the students to, to pull out those examples. But to give you a sort of an example of what it would look like, these are some of the examples of but which came up. So the students wrote these out and they had the, all these examples in front of them were of, of but from different texts within the textbook. Now what's really useful about this and, and what Jane Willis is talking about is obviously the students have already read the texts. They know what the texts mean because they're in the units the students have already studied. So they already know what the texts are about. So meaning's already there. The text, because it's from a textbook, 
it's pedagogically appropriate. The sentences are sentences that they can understand. And they've got a model of the sentence pattern and they've got lots of repetition there. So they can all look at it and, and, and start to see, okay, this is how buts use. And look, there's a comma very often. It goes in the middle of a, of a, of a, a structure. It's not going at the start of a structure, which again, might be very different from the, from the target language. So this is an example of getting the students to build their own um, co concordance from the textbook that they were using in front of them. And again, you could do that with any textbook, with any, you know, with, with any particular word or phrase that you wanted students to focus on. So you then need to follow it up. So again, we got the students to sort of report back identify the patterns about how it was being used and we put those onto the whiteboard. We got the students to do matching exercises with split sentences and again you, there's all kinds of apps where you can do that these days where they had to match up the start of the sentence and the end of the sentence. We got students to do activities where they're continuations so they would have the first part of the sentence and have to write the continuation using the sort of word and then we had some sort of writing games and short writing tasks to try to get them to use it. But the idea of the concordance, just to go back, is there's multiple examples of the key word in context for the students. They get lots of exposure to it. A few years later, I came across uh, a really good book by Candlin and Thurston, uh, which proposes a model for using concordances. And this is really useful because one of the things I struggled with as a teacher is, well, I can, you know, the idea of a concordance as I can see how it could help, but how do I use it? How do I incorporate it into lessons? And what Candon and Thurston came up with was a very simple process. It starts with look, familiarize, practice, and create. So it starts off by saying, well, when you do the activity, start off by getting students to look at a concordance, look at the key word and the words around it, and to think about what it means. And I'll go show you some practical examples in a moment. The second stage is once the students have sort of noticed it, is to familiarise themselves with the patterns and, and to highlight these patterns. They then get some practice and again some quite controlled practice of using it so that you know again there's a, a focus on accuracy at that stage and then the opportunity and this is the really important bit to actually use the piece of language either in a spoken task or in a piece of writing um, in order to carry out a particular function and again, that, that bit's really important. It's that chance to kind of go back. And sometimes the objection might be, well, what if the students don't use it? Well, if they don't use it, that's an opportunity then to go back and show, and show them something and say, well, what could you have put in there? And at which point you highlight the language again. <clears throat> so just to sort of give a practical example of this, these are some lines from a British national corpus. And uh, these are based around the word love. So we've got nine uh, lines from, the, from the, the British National Corpus. So the process we do is, is start off with the idea of look. So we get the students to, to look at this, first of all. Get them to look to the right. So what comes after the word? So we like love the place, love us, love them, love to see, love the heat. And then obviously lines five to nine are nouns rather than the verb usage. So again, this is where we get students to notice some of those things. So they get them to look to the right, then get them to look to the left. So again, they might notice, for example, with the verb, that there is, an, there is a subject straight before it. So I love the place, we love them. Uh, and again, that focus on things like, well, what does it mean? So again, we've got here different uses. So we've got some love as in actual love. We've got love as in like or strong liking um, for something. So, you know, so I love the heat is, you know, a, a strong preference for something. Um, we've also got other things like love as the abstract noun. 
But we've also got in line eight, we've got love as a form of address, um, which again, you know, might uh, seem you know, a usage of a word that the students have not come up with. But we've also got patterns. So uh, we've got things like uh, fall in love, which we might want to highlight. Uh, and being very much in love. And we've got in love there with the noun. So again, it's an opportunity to highlight some of those particular forms in there. And so this is an example coming from a British national corpus. So this is something we would pull from a, from a larger corpus. So I'm gonna give an example of using this structure of look, familiarize, practice and create into how you can incorporate uh, the idea of a corpus uh, of a concordance into an actual lesson um, and because again one of the things that I think teachers often worry about when they do look at something like concordance is how do I fit that in with what I normally do so this is uh, an example of concordance lines around the collocation raise money um, I took this from the British National Corpus uh, from the newspapers section um, so we've got a number of, of uh, sort of instances there of, of raise money. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But in terms of actual lesson, you'd start it off as you would with any other lesson. So you get the students interested at the beginning. So, for example, you might have a discussion about what would you do to raise money for charities? And so that would perhaps be the start of the hook question for the lesson. So perhaps give them some examples. Do a bungee jump. No, thank you. Uh, sit in a bath of mud, spend 24 hours in a room full of snakes, nope, can't see me doing that either, or others. So again, you've got that initial discussion with students as you would in most lessons to get them interested at the beginning before you take them to the, the concordance lines. So once we get to the concordance lines, we will give them the, the concordance lines to look at. But this is the this is the key bit that we would go about controlling how they go about looking at it. So we guide the opportunity. So we might start off by asking them to, to look to the right and say, right, okay, well, what words come after the word, the keyword in context? So they might notice things like raise money for something, they might raise money from things, raise money to do things. And then we might get them to look to the left. But we can also structure it with, around the material. So we've got the idea of, first of all, the concept. When people raise money, it's usually to help people, uh, help other people for charity. True or false? True. And then we ask them about what comes after the phrase raise money. So we'd elicit from the students the use of those prepositions. And then get to say, well, what do those prepositions introduce? So you raise money for the cause that you're raising money. You raise money from the particular people by doing something or towards the thing that you want. And then we have other patterns like infinitive of purpose. So you raise money to buy. So again, students will be focusing on that. So they're noticing the patterns. And by having that repetition, they get a lot of exposure on that. We could get them to then look on the left. So what words and phrases tend to come before it? So we've got the idea of in order to raise money. So it, you know, raise money is often used as an infinitive purpose. People organizing, preparing, launching things to raise money. Uh, people want to raise money or need help to raise money. Or there is an event or a program used to raise money. So again, we're getting students to think about the context, what other words get used with it, because it, the key problem off with vocabulary is not memorizing the word, it's, it's how do I actually use the word or I use the phrase. So once we've done that, that's the look at familiarization stages, we can then go into the kind of more familiar kind of practice. So we could do some controlled gap filling, uh, getting them to sort of use, the, use it accurately and focusing on, on accuracy at that stage. And we can do that through a number of activities, whether those are Kahoot quizzes or, or gap fills or matching exercises. We could do a whole range of those. And then we can get into the kind of the create stage. So this could be discussions about best ways of raising money. 
um, getting them to think about writing a letter to promote a charity event or getting them to look at sort of, uh, you know, uh, writing, you know, watching something and then writing a report around it. But the idea being that we kind of find a context where students can use that piece of language. Again, not to worry too much if the students don't use the language in the activity, because that is then an opportunity to go back to the students and say, right, you've not used this piece of language, where could you use it? Or how could you have said this differently? And again, it's about exposure and awareness. So this stage, I'm sort of rounding up by sort of talking about a little bit about some of the principles around using concordances and using concordance lines in the classroom. So first of all, you need to choose the corpus that you draw your examples from very carefully. Uh, it needs to be the right corpus for your learners. So for example, if you know the British National Corpus is is good, but it's very big, it's a wide range of text. You can choose written text or spoken text. So again, think about whether it's written or spoken language. Um, you might want to think about whether there is a, you know, if you're if you're dealing with students in a particular uh, discipline, maybe you want to use a corpus or put together a corpus of your own materials, uh, which you can use. Again, things like um, Microsoft Word is, you can use that these days to generate this kind of thing because the find function effectively functions as a as a, as a um, concordance builder. Um, you have to introduce the idea of concordances carefully to learners. If you put something like the raise money example in front of them um, straight away, the chances are the students will try to read it. Um, and you have to kind of explore it quite carefully with, with learners, giving them a few, a few examples. Perhaps the first time you do it, you might only want to give them three or four examples, uh, example lines to work with to get them used to the idea. Um, I would very much recommend the idea of using text that students have already used in the classroom. So if you have been using your textbook or materials, go back and look at those materials and pull out the language and put that into concordance lines. And you can use that activity where you get students to build their own concordance, to so get the students to do the mining. They can use a tool like OneNote or any sort of shared notebooks to build that together. And then you've, you know, you've got it there in front of you for the whole class and, and, and they've got the, the they've ex been, had another exposure because they've had to copy out the language. Think about what you want to look at or work with on the concordance. So again, the, the kind of the online tools you want to use for it. Guide the learners as what to look for. So this is where the, the look, familiarize, practice and uh, create uh, thing comes in. So again, that, that idea of look to the right, look to the left, um, and that, you know, giving them, guiding students what to look for, but also giving them the time to notice. Again, putting them into, let them talk about it in groups, let them notice it in groups. Uh, and that framework, I say I've, I've used that, I found that framework very, very helpful. It's very, I found it useful for constructing classes and doing it fairly quickly with, with a fairly small amount of pain involved. Uh, because I said, I'm thinking about busy teachers and um, don't give students too many example lines. Um, I think certainly for sort of a lower levels you want to keep it very kind of simple in terms of the number of lines you give them it's probably no more than 12 ever um, but you know even even down to about six or so if depending on the level of the students and their familiarity with it if you're using examples from a corpus like the british national corpus edit the lines very carefully the texts that get used can have all kinds of references in them and can be drawn from all kinds of subjects. They can have quite racy language in them um, because it's real language very often that's being pulled out. Um, that's not to say that, you know, that, that sort of taboo language is in some contexts not, a, not, a, not a, um, appropriate. I've worked with adult learners much of my life um, and, you know, have had, have had to do lessons with students who are going overseas who want a lesson on swearing. Um, so, that idea of kind of, you know, uh, ed editing it very carefully to make sure that 
the court calls lines aren't going to cause any problems from outside. <coughs> um, don't skip the create part. It's really important that once you've actually presented the language and students have had the chance to uh, explore it and to practice with it, that they get a chance to personalize that language. And again, if the students, when you get into the create stage, if students don't use the part of the language, don't be afraid to go back and highlight where they could have used the language. Because again, that is another awareness raising activity, that idea of getting students to go back and say, well, why could you have used that language? Or it's interesting that you phrased this this way, you could have phrased it like this. That is another exposure, it's another yeah, chat no, 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 language. Um, to sort of just to round off, here are some, uh, some links and there's examples, and I will share the, the slides afterwards to some of the different uh, corpora and word lists that are available. Um, I've mentioned the British National Corpus a few times. Um, there is the one I really do like down, which is the Corpus of Global Web-Based English, where you can pull examples from different websites from around the world, um, which is really good if you're looking at varieties of English. Um, and there is also the contemporary American English corpora as well. Again, and usually with the big corpora, you can also usually decide whether or not you want to look at written text or spoken text or a combination of both. Uh, and just a few references there. Uh, again, things I've mentioned, the Candlin and Thurston books are really good one um, for academic English. Um, and again, presents that that look familiarize practice create framework, which is really quite good. Uh, and then the Willis article, which is say is an, an older article, but it's still a very, very good article and well worth looking at. Okay, so uh, that's really everything I wanted to talk about in there. Um, I'm open to any questions, I guess. Thank you so much, Daniel. It was so interesting. Um, if any of the attendees wish to ask a question, please, you may go ahead and do so now. Any questions you wish to? You can even open your mics and communicate with Dr. Daniel directly. Questions, thank you. Hello, Dr. Daniel. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, could you please uh, elaborate a little bit how to personalize your corpus? Okay. Um, there's, I mean, there's a number of ways of doing it. So, for example, if you are um, you know, if you're using materials in the classroom, that's probably the most personalized corpus because if you then sort of take those and get them, sort of put them into, I mean, you, you can just put them into Word initially. Um, but if you go to something like, let me just find the, I'll just go back to the, the slide from earlier on. Because there is a really good website that's well worth exploring. Um, and it's Tom Cobb's website. The, the Lex Tutor CA website is an absolutely fantastic resource for teachers. You can build um, concordances. You've, you can scale, you can put your text in and run them against word lists to see the word frequency of different, uh, you know, against the academic word list or the you know the most frequent words and stuff. You can say say so you can build concordances, but if you basically you can cut and paste your text into that and it will it will then you can then search it for words in context and it will create a concordance for you so you know if you're wanting to do something with your own materials that is certainly the most uh that's that's even the, the most personalized um of the sort of uh, ways of building a, a, a corpus and, and concordancing um, and again that's to go back to my example with electronic engineers you know, this this was a very short course. Um, I put together a group of texts that that I felt was going to be, were going to be interesting and motivational for those students. So again, it was you know it was a very small corpus, um, and 
but but I was using it for a very specific purpose with that particular group. And I think, you know, for teachers, that's that's often large enough. I mean, there's lots of discussions around how big does a corpus have to be. Now, you know, it's very different from say, you know, making generalizations about the use of language to pulling out pedagogic examples. And I think, you know, if you're if you're using it to you know to to explore your materials and your classroom materials in more detail, then it's just the classroom materials really that need to go into it. Um, but in terms of the big corpora, if you go into something like the British National Corpus and you do a search on a particular word or phrase, it will pull out usually around 50 lines, which you can then cut and paste into another document and then edit down uh, so that you've got the ones that you want and the ones that are, are going to be the, you know, the ones you want to direct your learners to. Um, I did once have a group of students who were quite advanced and I did show them how to use the British National Corpus because they, are, they were at a stage where they could handle that kind of, of data and stuff, but I'd be quite careful about doing that with lower level learners. Does that answer the question? We have another question, Dr. Daniel. I have concern about its practicality at a very beginner's level. Somebody is saying that. Practicality at the? Very beginner's level. Yeah, um, I, again, you know, I, 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 that's where I came at it from. Um, so the example I had from here, you know, was concordancing from an elementary textbook from students who were in their third week of studies and the texts in the textbook were very short texts i mean they were a paragraph at most and they were very controlled language so the difficulty i had was that there were these four words that had not really been explained to the learners and it was just sort of assumed that they knew what they meant um which is why i kind of then went in and did that you know did it but i got them to build the the concordance lines so that they understood what they were looking at um and you know i think yeah i think i'd be very wary about taking naturalistic the natural data from something like the british natural corpus or something i mean you could i'm sure you could find some lines for that but it'd be probably better to use materials that the students are already familiar with um because that's the idea the students looking at the sentences one two three four five six here they all know what those sentences are because they've read the texts and they've been exposed to them. So they're not struggling with what they mean. Um, but they, you know, they're, they're, so they, they can they can actually focus on the thing you're looking at. But you're right, you know, you, you've got to be very careful about not overloading students, particularly at the lower levels, which is, you know, if I were if I was getting the students to um to look at these lines and they were not from texts that the students had been exposed to i'd probably use one two or three i wouldn't use any more than that i would just want them to see the pattern very very simply we have a question from danny uh, how would you advise a master student who wants to work on concordance what perspective is better to consider in terms of originality and feasibility oh it's a good one uh that's a really good question um I, I think I suppose it would look at, um, I suppose perhaps looking at learner training and how learners would would use those things. Um, I think certainly looking at them from sort of the, you know, the context of the, uh, of how you, the connection between the corpus and the concordance is quite an interesting one. Um, you know, you've got to be very careful with these things. So for example, you go into the British National Corpus and, and a lot of the language in there could be quite cultural and quite, um, you know, the, the mediation is a difficult point in there because it's it's hard to uh, align. So in terms of investigating, I think I would probably want to investigate it as a classroom tool about um, and how and how learners respond to it, but also perhaps looking at how learners uh you know how perhaps how effective it is as a as a as a tool in those classrooms so again you could you could set up um, a study whereby you presented vocabulary 
in the normal way or in the normal way in that particular classroom and then have a parallel group who are using some you know they're using some concordancing data based on the materials so maybe they do the materials and have the concordancing or something um, and again look at perhaps you know have if you go to articles like Batstone analysis and and the sort of all the work that's been done on awareness raising an explicit focus on grammar uh, or language it suggests that the students have that focused attention on on language that it that they're more likely to acquire it and perhaps that could be a perhaps that could be a, a you know a, a, a test that you could apply to to it to look and see well as a as a tool for awareness raising you know how effective is this compared to say you know more traditional classroom um, activities that could be quite an interesting way of exploring it um and you know uh yeah I, I think something like that would be quite an interesting study thank you uh danny you're still in the session if you wish to uh, ask anything else or ask this answer you can open your mic and ask dr daniel yourself hello hi hi danny you can hey, go ahead sir. No, 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 it's just a kind of feedback. I would like to thank him for the presentation and for the, let's say, the perspective he shared with me. Uh, as a professor at the university level, I can highlight that students, and I'm uh, within didactics, let's say. So students kind of complain about, they, they run out of, uh, uh, you know, interesting topics to work on. So I think that concordance is something that is original and new and interesting enough to work on. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad it's, it's been, been useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Anybody else would like to ask a question before we close the session? To what extent can concordance help to understand classroom management? Ooh, um, classroom management. Um, I'm not. I'm not well. Again, I mean that, that's. I'm not sure it, it's it's a classroom management tool. Um, what you possibly could do um, is again, if you are collecting data and transcribing it, um, you know, you could then perhaps go and look in, in, in instances of language use and see whether what occurs around it. Um, you know, other particular phrases and things that, that are signals in the classroom. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, there's maybe particular forms that teachers use or, in, or, or sort of prompts that teachers use. I mean, I know from my own teaching that the word right is often used to me to sort of, like I say, to bring everything back to str on, onto, onto track. So, you know, I'll go into the classroom and we'll have a few minutes at the beginning and then there'll be a point where I go, right. And that is the signal that we're starting. Um, so, you know, presumably if you transcribed it all, you could have a, a kind of concordance of lines of me saying, right. And then look at what I was doing in those instances. So you, you could look at sort of the language that's used to, to mark particular junctures in the classroom, but, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's more of a tool for um, getting students to look at sort of uh, sort of language in context, and particularly where you want them to focus on, uh, you know, a, 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 a chunk of language or you know co-occurrence of bits of language together. Um, you know, it gets across that idea. I think that um, that, that words don't work on their own. That it's you know, but when we teach for students a particular word, you know, it's no good learning a word like research on its own. You have to kind of know how that works and how it functions and what it partners with, um, and that's where things like concordancing can be quite good. Because if you gave students ten lines of the word research, and three of them had to carry out research and conduct, I mean, a couple had conduct research, students then they're being exposed to the idea, to, and they can sort of see for themselves. Oh, look, it co-occurs with those. And then noticing it and then noticing it for themselves and then you can build on that with activities um so yeah i think that there are 
there are things you can do with concordancing as, as part of research, if anything to do with exploring language, but um, it's mainly it is a language exploration tool rather than uh, other things. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, do we have any more questions? I, I think we can go on all day with Daniel and there will be no end because this topic is so interesting. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Daniel, and we are honored to have you at our conference. And uh, it was it was very informative and it, I think it's an eye opener for some of the teachers, how easily they can use, yes. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. And, uh, and you know I've really enjoyed today and listening to other people as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.